Well, uh, welcome everybody to um, the uh, public art tour on the MIT campus today with the List Visual Arts Center. Um, yeah, on behalf of MyTech, we're very thrilled to welcome Emily Garner from uh, the List Visual Arts and uh, Aviva, one of the students who'll be helping with this talk today um, to talk about some of the great art on the MIT campus. Um, the art that we miss seeing, you know, <laughs> haven't been there for a while. Um, and some of the amazing art that is coming to Kendall Square uh, shortly um, with, with some of the uh, rebuild and reconstruction there. So um, with that, um, Emily and Aviva, if you could um, let us explore the public art at MIT. Yeah, well, thank you, Diane, and thank you for inviting us to be part of your programming. Um, we really look forward to showing you a little bit about a glimpse of MIT, no matter where you are. Um, as we know, most of us are all remote at some place um, right now. But yes, my name is Emily Garner. I am the Campus and Public Program. Sorry, and we have, um, we are currently doing a lot of public programs online. So if you are interested in anything to do with like art, meeting artists for artist talks, um, we've been doing some participatory projects. If you're interested in making arts and doing communal exchanges. Um, so if you just wanna check out our website at listart.mit.edu. Um, we are the Contemporary Art Museum on campus. If you haven't visited, we are currently closed through the end of the year, but we're located in, um, the kind of the media lab building near MIT Medical and I'd be able to tell you a little bit more about our history, but we generally do about like six to eight exhibitions a year with contemporary artists and think of ourselves as kind of a lab of contemporary art where artists are really like kind of pushing that field forward. Um, we are always free and open to the public and all of our public programs are always, always free. Um, same with our virtual events. So hopefully we'll see you at one of those soon. But one of the programs I do run with um, the MIT students is our student guide program. So Aviva is here today as she will kind of share a little bit um, about the public art across campus, both indoors and outdoors. Um, and the collection across campus, and I will be helping her with the visual presentation. So we'll both be here. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function along the way. And Aviva. Thank you so much, Emily. Hi, everyone. Um, as Emily already said, my name is Aviva, and I am a student tour guide for the list at MIT's Contemporary Art Museum. Um, but I'm an undergraduate student, a sophomore in course 12, which is Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. Um, and in that, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm really interested in the different ways that natural systems can kind of influence each other throughout time um, and in the different multidisciplinary ways that we can learn about the earth. And it's from that interest that um, I'm going to kind of be steering this tour through MIT's campus um, because I'm really fascinated by the idea of different disciplines building off of each other and playing with each other and um, through them being able to learn more about the, the like variety of different fields that they come from. So this is really something that uh, I think MIT fosters um, this interdisciplinary spirit. We have programs like the Media Lab, um, whose primary goal is really to like mix and match different fields of study. Um, but one thing that I think is really cool is that the actual architecture of MIT itself um, allows and fosters this um, interdisciplinary and collaboratory spirit. So one great example of that um, is the Infinite Corridor, which um, if you go onto campus is kind of an infamous focal point. Um, it's this long stretch of over a hundred feet that connects the majority of the main buildings on campus. Um, but one thing that really stands out to me about the Infinite is that unlike on other college campuses where you might have like one building dedicated to chemistry and one building dedicated to history, um, and they're like on totally separate areas of the campus grounds. The infinite brings together all of these different fields in like one streamlined fashion so that you have professors and students and labs in entirely different fields right next to each other collaborating alongside each other. So really um, the campus of MIT itself was built to have these type of conversations. Um, and that is why I'm excited to bring that conversation today with you. Um, in thinking about art and science and the different ways that these two fields interact. 
Um, so before we begin the tour, focusing on that um, theme, um, I wanted to let you know that I'll be asking a lot of discussion questions to the group. Uh, sometimes I'll ask for you to use the chat. Sometimes I'll ask for you to use, there's an annotation tool that I will explain um, how to use once you get there, um, or just like to share your thoughts. So if you're comfortable, I really encourage you to speak out and join in the conversation. Um, I can talk forever about these pieces, and I think that it would be more fun if I wasn't the only one doing it, even though um, I'm happy to ramble on. Um, so just please feel free to join in. Um, and also ask questions at any point in the chat. Um, if you want me to talk more about something, I will do my best to uh, answer everything. Um, so first, let's try that out. Um, could you please type in the chat um, anything that you think of when you hear the terms art and science put together? It can be something like a project um, or a company that you've heard of, um, or even just like a feeling you have when you think of those two terms. Diane says magic, amazing. And it's also okay, you can like think more about this and we can come back to it, but I'll give a couple more seconds. Ooh, color science, yeah. That's a great one, absolutely. Graphs and charts, yeah, visualizing scientific data, nature, art that intrigues scientists, imagination, innovation, great. These are all awesome thoughts. So I'm super excited to keep delving into this. Um, first, to give you a little bit of background into the List Center, uh, who we are, what we do. Uh, so the List was established in 1985. Um, it succeeded the Hayden Gallery, which was located right next to the um, current Hayden Library. Um, and the list hosts several temporary exhibitions now within its walls, but really the collection expands much farther past these exhibitions that happen inside the list itself um, with the public artwork that we'll be talking about today. So this really spans the entire campus grounds. Um, much of that public art was purchased through something called the Percent for Art Program, which was formally instituted in 1968. Um, and the way that it works is that every new building that um, comes onto campus or every new major construction project, a percentage of the funds allocated to, um, to perform or to putting up that new construction project actually gets put towards an accompanying um, public art piece. And so what ends up happening through this is that a lot of the buildings on campus have a corresponding uh, public art piece that was made to in some way reflect or enhance the construction project itself. Um, and so that creates some really interesting conversations that we'll be getting into later. Um, but first, I just wanted to point out um, a really important character for MIT's campus for architect, Ian Pei. Um, he is a very famous architect. He designed the Louvre, that's him smiling in front of it. Um, and he was also an undergrad at MIT. Um, and he designed um, the MIT Les Social Arts Center, which you see on the right here. So now pretend, I know we're not on campus, but imagine you just walked through those doors of the photo on the right and you are inside this beautiful atrium space. There's lots of sunlight shining in from the top, um, glass panels everywhere. And the first thing that your eyes are drawn to is this huge wall spanning pretty much the entire side of the building. Um, and this piece is called Here There by Kenneth Noland. Um, and it's the first piece that we'll be talking about today. So I already mentioned that Ian Pei is the architect of the building. Um, as he was creating the list, he uh, commissioned Kenneth Noland to create this giant mural that you're looking at now. Um, so Noland, Noland was actually not um, really comfortable or familiar with architecture or physical spaces. Um, he was trained as a painter and he had never really worked in a three-dimensional or architectural space before. Um, so this, uh, project um, here there was really a collaborative one in which he and I and Pei worked really closely together to take all of his painterly background and bring it to life in a new media and a new format. Um, what you're looking at are these uh, uh, metal frames that line the side of the wall with dashes and dots of color all throughout them that create this kind of sense of movement and motion as you're walking through. Um, the different colors pop out 
um, and just create this sense of wonder and lightness and um, this trajectory through the space. And I think it's a really incredible thing to see in person if you ever have the opportunity to, I highly suggest it. Um, but I'll talk really quickly about some of Nolan's um, um, experiences and where he drew on um, different inspirations from to create this mural. So he was very inspired by Bauhaus, which you can see on the screen, I have a little text for. Um, the Bauhaus was a design movement in uh, Weimar, Germany, and it was really founded based off of this idea of unifying all of the arts um, towards architecture and towards this physical space. Um, and so it saw the three-dimensional as the um, manner in which to bring together all of these different perspectives in the art field um, or of different art fields. Um, and so I really, I think that even though this isn't necessarily a moment of art and science interdisciplinary thought, it definitely is this idea of coming from a different field in Nolan's case, painting, and then using that field to apply it to an entirely different surface. Um, so knowing all of this background, um, Let's take a look at this entire piece. I'll give you a second just to kind of let your eye wander um, and look at the different colors and think about the following questions. Where do you think that the artwork begins? Where do you think it ends? And what do you think is the distinction here between artist and architect? Um, and Emily will show you um, the outside of the building as well um, because it's important to see that it kind of stretches around the building, so. Right, these questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Emily, could you go back to slide three really briefly? Yeah, exactly. So you can see kind of how the mural, it's a little difficult, but it like stretches outside of the building and actually continues. So it's not just the inside that's part of the piece. Right, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so. With these questions, take like 20, 30 seconds, just think about them. Um, and now we're going to do an annotation activity. So if everybody can click on view options, it should be at the top of your Zoom screen. Um, there should be a option for you to click text. Um, and if you can find that, take um, a sticky note, any of them that you see. And I like this because it allows us to kind of see what everybody's thoughts are as we're, we're thinking about this together. Try and like type out um, just anything that comes to mind when you're thinking about these questions um, onto one of the sticky notes. And if you have any questions about how to do this with the annotation tool, please just let me know. Amazing, somebody said that the building itself is art. I totally agree. Or an unbroken chain. In the chat, we got um, Kimberly saying that it is a circle, for sure. A Mobius strip, no beginning, no end. Spiritual versus technical, Ooh, that's an interesting one. Hmm, this one is interesting. The architect thinks about the function first and the artist about emotions. Absolutely. Whether it's objective oriented or not, fantastic. Okay, amazing. These are all great thoughts. Thank you so much for sharing. Architect has parameters, artist has no limit. That's an interesting one, right? Because the, what are really the parameters of architecture? I mean, there are physical parameters when it comes to maybe how tall you can build or, or what shapes you can make to safely sustain a building, but those parameters are changing all the time. We have new technologies now to create um, buildings and go to heights that we wouldn't have been able to do 50, 100 years ago. So there must be a limit at some point, right? But that, those parameters change, yeah. Someone's leaving hearts. Oh, that's awesome if you agree with it. That's cool. Okay, great. So we're gonna move on for now, but there will be lots of other opportunities to chime into the discussion. So thank you all. I think there should be a way to clear the annotations. 
Yes, amazing. Okay, so now we will move on to um, another Bauhaus piece. So continuing with these modernist influence, Bauhaus influences, this is Martin Voices Through Layers and Leaves. Um, so before I even tell you anything about this, we're actually gonna do um, another interactive moment. Um, if you go back to the annotation tools, I want you to draw a circle around the first part of this piece that stands out to you. Um, no other information. I'm not telling you anything about this piece, just like what stands out to you, where is your eye drawn to? Ooh, awesome, okay. Right, the different colorful panels, somebody circled the grade at the bottom, the yellow, the blue, the red. Okay, fantastic. So it seems like we're all drawn to not all of the same places, but mostly the colorful panels, yeah. Does anyone wanna share? Um, you can do this in the chat. If you also wanna speak out, you are very much welcome to just um, let me know. I think I think the way that we can do that is we can raise, raise hands or you can unmute yourself possibly. Um, but why did you circle that part? And does it remind you of anything? Ooh, vaccine, okay. Hit the nail on the head. Looks like a plant with branches leaves blossoming outwards. It's just where my eyes were drawn. Absolutely. Okay, wow, well that was slightly a spoiler. That is so okay. I'm glad that uh, that came through to you, this idea of nature and a flower blossoming outwards. Um, that is very much what Martin Boyce was trying to accomplish. So his idea here, and maybe the title gives it away a little bit with through layers and leaves, um, but it was to create this stainless steel wall frame um, of perforated color panels that look like leaves um, to build this illusion to the natural world where you kind of have this industrial uh, steel sculpture crawling out of the wall or growing out of the wall um, as, a, as a plant might or as any other natural element might. Um, and so it's installed on the wall, um, not like flush against the wall, but rather with like a, a few inches between at some points um, to create that illusion of growth. Um, so before making this piece, um, Boyce was influenced by uh, some Cubist sculptures, Jan and Joel Martel. Um, and I think if we clear the annotations, the next slide should have a photo of their work. Thank you so much. Um, Emily says, what you cannot notice here, but the heat grates at the base circled in green is actually the same design as the artwork. Right, yes, thank you, good point, Emily. Um, and Anthony says they, uh, they were drawn to the grate because they enjoyed thinking about where the form of art and function of the building meets, fantastic. Um, so, right, so these um, are actually meant to be trees, um, and they were built um, out of concrete in these French modernist gardens, and the idea was really to just reimagine the natural world, but through the framework of today's industrialized world. So, given um, the rate at which technology in an industry is ever increasing, um, what might the natural world look like today in 20 years and 50 years? Um, in the 1950s, John and Joel Martel were dealing with these questions. Today, um, Boyce is dealing with the same ones. Um, I think it's things that we think about quite often now, um, given the uh, rapid increase of climate change. Um, and so really what Boyce was trying to do with his work, um, and this will be for the next slide, um, was to engage with this idea of closer and closer, this call to examine our relationship with the natural world more closely and to reflect upon the different ways that industrialization with his materials influence our environment. Um, so the questions that he seems to be asking are, um, and this should be, next slide, thank you. 
the questions that he seems to be asking are, what might a utopia look like in today's world? And how can we bridge this gap between urbanization and an appreciation for the natural environment? We won't be answering these questions now, but I encourage you to think about them as we explore the rest of the pieces, because they are themes that will, will be continuously coming up in the work um, that we'll be seeing for the rest of the tour. So now we are moving on to Scientia by Ursula von Riddingsvard. Um, and this is a great example of the percent for art program that I was telling you about before in that um, this piece um, was built as the McGovern Institute for Brain Research was built. So it was um, the funding for it came from a portion of the funding allocated for the brain research building. Um, it is this gorgeous, tall, towering 25 foot sculpture um, made out of bronze right at the entrance of the building. Um, so it really kind of sets the tone as you're walking into this biology building um, for you to look at this piece and think about the ways that the research happening inside the building and the art um, play with each other, interact with each other, complement each other. Um, but first, before I tell you more about this piece, we're actually going to watch a short video about the process um, behind making it. This is the pattern that gets drawn on the plastic and then placed on the wax. Cool. So what you saw there in that video was the process of putting together Sientia, um, which was really, in, in my opinion, it's one that mimics almost the scientific process um, where you have, you know, experience and observation and repetition and inquiry and concentration. And you're constantly looking at the different ways that from the previous state that you have, you can look at new questions. Uh, and that's really how von Bredingsvart approached this. Um, it was an experimental design where uh, she was constantly honing her techniques and refining um, the different ways that she was going to be putting together this massive sculpture. Um, and some of the tools that you just saw were these, um, were these uh, essentially it started out as these milled ready-made cedar beans um, upon which Ron Riddingsvar drew these wandering spontaneous lines without um, forethought or planning. Um, just kind of going with what she felt the cedar beam's uh, natural form should be. Um, and then once she had created these lines, she lacerated along them um, and built this bronze sculpture out of it, um, which she cast. So I think that that this, this idea of art being something that um, maybe comes from uh, intense concentration, but um, a place really of, uh, where, where you know exactly what you're going to do next, I think is, is an opinion that a lot of people have about art where they see something and they think, well, the, the artist was just kind of working sequentially through it, um, as opposed to seeing the process of creating art as really a scientific one, where there are steps along the way, where you question yourself, where um, you wonder what direction to take the piece in. Um, I love that this is a piece that reflects that um, creative process. Uh, so now on the next slide, you'll be able to see, oh, my bad, on the slide before, um, you'll be able to see kind of a bigger form of Scientia. I was wondering um, what you saw in this piece. Um, there are many different shapes that it kind of resembles in nature. Um, and I was wondering if any of them stood out to you. So if you see anything, type in the chat um, or feel free to speak out. Tree bark, giant kelp. 
yeah, both of those things stand out to me as well. Seaweed. Coral. Yeah, definitely very reminiscent of marine environments at the top there. A synapse. It's very apt for the brain building, absolutely. Another thing that I love about this piece is that it opens up at the top, almost like a crown. Um, I just think that that is one, a really lovely visual and two, creates the sensation of the sculpture itself being kind of a vessel. Um, and, and vessels generally have connotations of femininity, um, motherhood, womanhood. Um, and I like that play with nature and femininity and thinking about, you know, concepts of mother earth and what that means. Um, so that's one thing that stands out to me as well. So to finish off this piece, I will leave you with a quote from um, Lori Hart McGovern, who was the co-founder of the McGovern Institute. Um, the building is named after her. And she was also a member for the Council of Arts at MIT. So uh, here we have a woman who was very involved in the uh, scientific research happening on campus and also the different um, artistic programs happening. Um, and she commissioned the piece and she said the following about it. Scientia represents that art and science are not separate entities. Art defines our humanity, advances our curiosity, and forces us to ask big questions. Scientia invites you in. I think that that's a really beautiful quote when I first read it. Um, and I thought it set the tone for this tour quite well, so I wanted to share it with you. Now we are moving on to a different piece. This is a Northwest Pas Passage by Oliver Eliasson. I'm going to do the same thing that I did with Through Layers and Bees. I'm not going to tell you anything about this piece. I just want to know, what do you think is going on in this photo? What are you even looking at? And this is only a tiny part of the piece. So I'm showing you a little sneakily, like only a select view. Um, but what do you think is happening? Lisa says icebergs. Very apt. Maybe also physically, how do you think this is built? Like what, what exactly are you really looking at? <laughs> it looks like a nose ring, absolutely. I've seen this in person so I won't spoil it, okay. Fair looking up at it. Mirrors. Okay, great. So we've arrived at the physical properties of this piece. You are right. Um, these are mirrors. So the next view, you should be able to see it a little bit better. But essentially, the way that this piece was built um, are these hanging mirrors. And the rings are actually not entire rings at all, but they're um, actually concentric half circles with LEDs on the inside so that the LEDs are reflected by the mirrors and it makes you think that you're staring into um, these loops, but in fact, they're really just half circles and the reflection is what creates this sensation of continuity and its circles. Um, and those mirrors in the passageway um, next to MIT Nano continue all the way down um, along the ceiling. So um, not right now, but in a later slide, you'll be able to see a better view of that. Um, but I have another question before we get into that. Um, does anyone know what the Northwest Passage is? Can you give like a thumbs up reaction? Do you know how to do that? Um, there's like a little reactions button at the bottom and you can give like claps or thumbs up if you know what the Northwest Passage is. Okay, I see a thumbs up. Another thumbs up. Another thumbs up. Okay, fantastic. Um, so to, for those of you who don't know, um, the Northwest Passage is this sea route that stretches between the Atlantic and the Pacific um, through kind of the Arctic Ocean above North America. You can see um, the red line passing it. And this passage actually used to be um, infamous for being frozen and impossible to pass. But since the summer of 2007, um, the um, oceans have warmed dramatically enough that the ice is actually melted. and um, and ships are not able to pass through it. So this once impossible passage um, through the Arctic Ocean 
is now being opened as a trade route for more ships to pass through. Um, and Ulf Eliasson, um, he'll talk a little bit more about it later, I'll be showing you a video, but he was really drawn to that dynamic of this once untouchable place is now reachable by humans because of uh, anthropogenic activities that induce climate change. Um, and that it is actually the cycle where now the boats are able to pass through the passage, they are adding to the CO2 emissions and we're um, increasing in the impacts of climate change. So it's really like this, this destructive cycle um, in, in opening up these trade routes. Um, so the artwork that you're seeing here is also called Northwest Passage and it's inspired by um, that event. Um, it's the site specific installation in the breezeway off of the outfinet. Um, oh, the alphanet is what I jokingly call like the outside of the infinite. Um, it's this like open passageway outside of the buildings um, right next door. Um, and it's right outside the MIT Nano Labs. And this is another percent for art example where um, members of the lab were um, very involved actually in choosing the piece. Um, and so what you're looking at here are these seven semi-circular rings, um, each lined with the diffused LED lights that I was talking about. Um, and you have this optical illusion where as you're walking through, um, you can look up at the mirror and kind of see yourself reflected in it. And it's this reminder, um, I see it at least, as a reminder of how collective we all are um, as a system and it being our kind of collective responsibility to stop um, the impacts or the effects of climate change. Um, and so there's that happening on one hand and then on the other hand, it's also this reminder kind of about the connectivity of human and natural systems and just the circle of life. Um, those are all things that I think of when looking at it, um, but the artist has more to say, so you could hear from him as well. One of the great things that culture and art is capable of is actually giving a physical language to something that is otherwise highly mediated or abstract, meaning that something like climate change is very difficult to understand because it's just I can't touch it, I can't measure it. It's not like a, it's not like a ball in my hand. It was actually for the first time possible to sail the Northwest Passage on the western side of the North Pole connecting two oceans and shortening the way of sailing. And it's been long time debated whether this will ever, ever be possible. And now with global warming and the melting of the ice, it suddenly is possible. Um, and in that sense, I thought this is a nice topic I'm interested in, and the fact that when you see satellite or pictures of, of the ocean, airplane pictures of, of this particular ocean, you see the ice scattered around and you realize that these white ice sheets, they look like small islands or small pieces of land. And you, when, if you wanted to cross, you would have to jump from one to the other. And um, that had interested me. I'd actually made drawings of that in my studio and I was just interested in the fact that um, a lot of what we know as being stable has become unstable. And a lot of the things that we take for granted as out of the reach of change are in fact now changing. So the world as we know it, has uh, become a lot more relative. And with regards to the whole sort of idea of nanotechnology, I thought, okay, this is also interesting because in a way, nano is about making what we could not see before visible or making the invisible visible. As an artist, I'm trying to sort out, well, what kind of art or what type of artistic interventions in the world can I do to bring about a more action-driven relationship with the climate or an opportunity for you to see, well, turning your knowledge into action is actually something that is a little easier than I thought it would be. And actually, the climate is not as abstract as I thought it would be. It's right here in front of me. I can touch it and it is understandable. And it's not like big science. It's, it's quite specific and, and so on. I think that Art alone should not be the one who communicates the explicified version of what climate challenge is, but it is one of the th great things that I think is exciting to work with as an artist is, is to make things which we know explicit as something as we feel, giving it a, you could call it a emotional narrative, uh, besides the sort of data-driven data -driven narrative. 
the artwork here came out of my interest in, in various other artworks to work with geometry and these more random shapes, as you could say, these sort of puddles or pools or ice sheets. And I'm actually, in this case, particularly interested in the fact when you look up, you obviously, you obviously see the reflection of the ground because it's a mirror and you look up and you see on the ground. And, and to that extent, it is actually like a ceiling which, which has these small islands, if you want, of the ground. And I've worked with that a few times, but we could also see them as stepping stones should we be in a situation where the South Pole melts and the chances are significant, right? It's not just some crazy idea. It actually is. That probably means that half of Boston is completely underwater, not just a little, but like literally underwater. And going around on the campus is likely to be jumping from one stepping stone to the other. So when I talk about these things, I talk about the kind of way that a space contains not just us, but also our action and our ability to interact and share things. And I think art can be a part of that equation and artistic interventions and amplify what makes the space, the space better. Amplify the fact that we should be open-minded to the extent of understanding that spaces actually have social potential as well. And sometimes you need a language or you need a sort of a, a quality in a space uh, which simply triggers that sort of social or that generous type of activity. Amazing. Thank you, Emily. Um, so now we move on to our second to last piece. This is Bars of Color Within Squares by Saul DeWitt. Um, it is another site-specific installation similar um, to the one that we just looked at in that it was made for the space that it now inhabits. Um, and it's this huge piece, um, nearly 5,500 feet, covering an atrium space off of the Infinite Corridor. Um, and if any of you have ever been to Bars of Color Within Squares or if you're interested in going, it's actually quite hard to find where it is. Um, and sometimes the door is locked and sometimes you can't enter. It has this quality of being kind of like a secret garden, this space off of the busyness of the infinite. Um, and really as you're walking through the infinite, it's always bustling, there's always movement and talking and chatter. Um, and when you go off into this kind of like secret room, secret corner, and then suddenly you're in this bright space um, above you is light streaming in through the ceiling and you just see these playful, colorful bars of color lining the floor that you're walking on. Um, it has that scent of like a, something special, something hidden, a little secret park. Um, and for that reason, I really love this piece. I think it's a beautiful one to experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so it's really, it's a favorite of many visitors to MIT, I think. Um, but it was Saul DeWitt's last piece um, before his death, in, or one of his last pieces before his death in 2007. Um, and Saul DeWitt is a really fascinating artist. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about his kind of like ethos as a creator um, and the way that he goes about creating art. Um, so he's kind of infamous for offering these set of rules and sketches for a piece, um, but then leaving it up to others to actually assemble and put together that piece. Um, so despite these strict rules that he lays out, um, he's always kind of surprised by the final results. Um, and I'll get into that um, more, but it's this idea of really like, who, who is the artist and what is the role of the artist? Is the role of the artist to assemble the piece? Is the role of the artist to think of the piece or to decide what the piece means? Um, these are questions that um, are perfect to discuss with Solowit. Um, and I think also kind of get at the core of uh, interdisciplinary work when you have many people working together on one project from different backgrounds, um, what that kind of creates. So yeah, exactly. I always hope to be surprised by final results is, um, is something that's always quoted um, of having said. And here you can see a little bit better um, the like perspective you have as you walk through the atrium space. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the material um, that this piece is made out of. Um, it is made out of terrazzo, which is this glass and epoxy kind of resinous mix. Um, and it's actually material that originated in Venice 
um, early Venice as this like low cost, um, durable flooring material. So it was really not an artistic material whatsoever. It was one for just fundamentally building things. Um, and in order to use it as an artistic material and to bring out these really vibrant, bright pigments and colors like you see here, um, Saul, similar um, to Ursula von Bredensbard in Scientia, went through this experimental process um, where he was playing with um, the different like chemical ways to bring out these colors and tones. Um, and the final result is really a, a stunning one where you have these beams of sunlight coming in and hitting the glass. Um, and I think another thing that's cool about that, about the space being open at the top, is that as the weather changes on a cloudy day or on a rainy day, I'm not sure what the weather is like right now in Cambridge, but I'm assuming it's raining. I feel like it's a safe bet. Um, you would have the clouds moving over and kind of casting these shadows on the glass. Um, and what ends up happening is that the art piece changes as the natural world outside changes. And so your experience also in the space and with the art changes as the natural world changes. Um, and it's just another way that I think site-specific art um, in a way that few other types of art can um, really interacts with the space and with the natural world and um, allows for those conversations to form, flow more easily um, when looking at the art. So that brings us to the end of all of the pieces that I'm going to talk about that are currently existing on MIT's campus. Um, and now we are offering you a sneak peek, super exciting, into a piece that does not actually yet exist. Um, so this is Agnieszka Kurant's The End of Signature. Um, and I'm very excited about it. It is not up on MIT's campus, as I've said, um, but it was just announced to be coming to Kendall Square um, and really only briefly announced to the public. So you are among the first people to hear or know about this, uh, most likely. Um, so what The End of Signature is, is this um, another site-specific installation, this giant communal signature um, that is hanging off, that will be hanging off of the side of the building in Kendall Square. Um, and the communal signature that is hanging is actually one that um, Emily collected in that she went um, last June through September, I believe, um, to members of the MIT community and collected hundreds of signatures amongst MIT community members. Um, and then sent them all to Courant. And Courant was collaborating with a, with a programmer um, who uh, was building this um, software that allowed him to pull together all of these different signatures and create this morphed single signature from all of them. It's kind of this like aggregate forms all coming together unified into one. Um, and if you're curious as to like technically how that happens, um, there's a video from MIT CSAIL, one of the MIT computer science labs, um, to show you a little bit more about visually how that occurs. Yeah, one super quick, you can watch it. Awesome, yeah, so essentially you get like this kind of like scramble of everybody's signatures and then the software morphs it into this aggregate form, um, which unifies everything. Um, so this work is commenting on a lot of different stuff. Um, it's definitely one that kind of takes you back and makes you question like, am I supposed to be able to read that? Like that was my first impression when I saw it. I was like, what does it say? Um, but um, some of the things that Karant has mentioned herself that she is commenting um, on with this piece is one, the decline of handwriting in um, our technological age. I actually remember very strongly in elementary school being taught to write in cursive and all of my teachers telling me you're going to need this for middle school and middle school everyone will expect you to write in cursive and then I got to middle school and nobody expected me to write in cursive but I had spent years learning cursive before what I thought was nothing um, and then in high school I wasn't even writing in print anymore because at that point I was just typing on my computer all the time um, and so it's, it's interesting um, phenomenon that's happening in our modern world where handwriting is actually becoming less and less common. Um, <laughs> somebody said you're not old enough. <laughs> um, that's fair. Um, but really, we are, we are losing this touch um, with handwriting that used to be um, just like a fundamental part of day-to-day -day life. So much is happening now um, on computers. 
And so that was one thing that Crump wanted to talk on at least. Um, but then she also wanted to kind of play with this idea of the kind of individuality and authorship in society. Like what happens when we bring together all of these different signatures and condense them into one form? And when I heard that, what I thought of was how I'm currently, you know, thinking about maybe working in a lab one day, or I've had experiences um, in different labs at MIT working as a student researcher. And what really stuns me is the depth of collaboration that happens across institutions and really across countries and continents in scientific research. You could have one paper come out that has 20 co-authors um, and they've all worked together to create this one paper and to, to produce this body of research. And then of course, that paper is then cited in you know, tens to hundreds of other papers. And so all of, all of research is just this compounding of knowledge. And sometimes what can happen with that is it's really hard to define really ownership of knowledge and, and authorship of knowledge. And so um, I think at least that Karan is kind of commenting on this idea of assigning intellectual and creative ownership and how it's important to give credit absolutely where credit is due, um, but, but kind of illuminating how difficult that is um, today when everything is so interconnected through technology. Um, and then using art, of course, to, to comment a little bit about the research world, I think is always fun. Um, so now I want us to do an activity together. Um, actually, before we do this activity, I was wondering, um, somebody, somebody commented, you're not old enough, that's fair. I actually wanna know what your thoughts are on this. I remember very vividly coming up with my own signature in seventh grade. I think I was just like bored in class one day um, and I had a piece of paper and I just wrote my signature like consciously over and over again until I was satisfied with what I had made. Um, and a signature is really such a personal thing. I mean, you use it for official documents. Um, you use it to sign that you agree with something, that you comprehend something. Um, do you remember the moment that you created your signature? And does it mean anything to you? I'm curious to, to hear what you all think. Someone says that they didn't create a signature until college. Yeah, I honestly, I might change mine. Mine is very... Um, seventh grade cursive of me. There's like no fancy loops. I feel like adults always have fancy loops. It's an autograph. That's a great way to think about it. I really like that actually. Risa says that theirs is always changing. Absolutely. Definitely the signature when you're like signing a receipt is different than the signature when you're signing like an official document. That's for sure. Yeah. Diane had a similar experience to me, third grade penmanship teacher. Seems to get lazier with each passing year. Fourth grade, yeah. It, it's crazy to me that um, some of us have these experiences of like in third or fourth grade, creating this visual that then defines us for the rest of our, and not defines us, but is like a, in some way definitive aspect um, for the rest of our life. So yeah, I just think that that's a fascinating thing. Um, so knowing this about each other now, what I want us to do is create our own end of signature um, where we are basically going to go back to the annotation tool. And oh, Emily said something. Over 800 signatures. Yes, I didn't include the number. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, Emily collected over 800 signatures from the MIT community. I mean, that's just a huge, huge community that then is aggregated into one form. Um, and once we do the activity, I'm going to ask kind of a question about that. But um, basically, like, does that form really represent all of those individuals then? Or is it, is it representing something else? It's something that I'm curious about. Um, but before we kind of delve into that conversation, we'll do this activity. Um, on the next slide, I think, should be a blank one. Yes, perfect, okay. Um, can you all take the annotation tool? There should be, instead of text, there should be like a drawing capability. Um, and I want us to make our own giant signature. We don't have the software, so it might be a little bit messy. Um, but basically one person can just start off by writing their signature. And then if you see anybody else's signature, take like the tail end or, or build off of one point and try and kind of connect all together um, where all of your signatures kind of form into this one uh, unified visual. I'm excited to see what it looks like. Oh, 
this looks so cool. I like also that everybody has different colors and um, different thicknesses with their pen. I'm curious, are you just writing wherever you feel like there's open space or are you, is there like a thought process behind like where you're tagging your signature onto? Like maybe you see somebody else has an A in their name so you like added your A next to theirs or something. Like what was the, what was there any, um, did you have any thoughts about it? Mm, Anthony says that they looked for an upstroke to connect to, so it felt natural. Kimberly added theirs to the end of another. Yeah, I think it's kind of like this microcosm, microcosmic activity in that um, we do so much collaborative in, in our everyday lives, lives and we're always kind of having to think like, how, how do we build off of somebody else's work and work with somebody else so that our point of view and our um, individuality comes across and yet we're like still coming together to create something bigger. Um, I think like even just this small thought process here of, of deciding like how to add on to this piece um, is, uh, is kind of indicative of like bigger thought processes. Pamela saw the P and thought that they had done it. <laughs> That's funny. Amazing. Tried to connect to the upstroke of the orange piece, but it moved. Oh, sorry, I know. The technology is hard. Zoom sometimes gets a little finicky. So do you think now that we have our final visual, do you feel like this visual represents you? Like if you were to look at it, would you say, yes, I am, this is, this is my signature? Or is there a different experience? Do you feel like it's like a part of a whole? Not with the tools we had to use, that's fair. Maxine enjoys the mix of styles and personalities. Me too. Okay, amazing, thank you so much. Um, Emily says, individuality gets lost a bit, but I do like the full image as a representation of who is on this tour. Yeah, absolutely. It's a cool way to kind of cement this one moment in time of this group of people who are here for this experience now. Amazing. So thank you all. We are nearing the end of the tour. I think there's five minutes to the hour. Um, I hope that you learned a little bit about MIT's campus, a little bit about the public art available currently and coming up, um, and, that, and that you just had a good time thinking about the different ways that art and science um, engage in conversation with each other. Um, so in closing, art can tell stories about science, science can inspire art. These two things are constantly in flux. Um, and I think that the work on MIT's campus does a really great job of bringing those themes to life. Um, so if you have any questions about any of the pieces that I talked about uh, today, I'm happy to answer them the best I can. Um, and also um, you can always go to listart.mit.edu um, for a really comprehensive guide to all of the public art um, available um, on our campus um, that will tell you more about pieces that I talked about today and also pieces that I didn't touch on. Um, and there are many, many more pieces that I didn't touch on. So if you are in any way curious, um, that's a great site to go to. I just wanted to add in, first off, thank you all for coming and thank you Aviva for that tour. Um, this is Emily Garner speaking. Um, we have like over 70 works of art across MIT's campus and it actually is quite impressive for all of those that are part of the MIT community. Um, I've lived in the area for a long time and then until I worked there, I really didn't understand the breadth of the museum quality work that's really just open to the public and free on MIT's campus. And it's also the, one of the most robust or is like the most robust like university like percent for art programs that are still going. 
Um, and there's actually going to be new installations happening on Vassar Street um, next month. So there's always new public art coming um, as well. So you can always keep an eye on it if anybody does drive-bys outside or um, is on campus for the day. It is like serves as a nice kind of fun way to kind of look around. And then I want to thank everyone for coming. I'm going to stop screen sharing now, but yeah, please feel free to visit our website and then feel free to ask. We'll stay around for a couple more minutes if anybody has any questions, but thank you all. Thank you so much, Emily and Aviva for an amazing talk today. It was uh, really remarkable and it was great to interact. So thank you. Thank you all so much.